thanks, Michael, for being here and for writing such a thought-provoking book. Um, it's provoked a number of questions, which I'll throw at you now. But I'd like you all to be thinking, too, about what you'd like to ask. So as you're listening to us talk, keep that in the back of your minds, and we'll come back to you for questions uh, in about 45, 50 minutes. Um, so let's start with the title of the book. Um, most of you here probably know that where the Senkaku Islands are. Um, they're contested territory. Japan calls them the Senkaku Islands and says that they belong to Japan. China says they're the Jiaoyu Islands and belong to China. Um, the Senkaku paradox, you actually use that in two different ways in the book, two interesting different ways. So I'll start with one way, and that is that um, you take an issue like this, these uninhabited islands, some of them basically just rocks. Um, but because China and Japan feel that this uh, is an issue over which they need to stand their ground because Japan has been the predominant power in Asia for a century and now China's rising and it's challenging Japan in all kinds of ways, it seems like small beer to the United States looking at it from afar. But to China and Japan, it matters. And the fact that it matters to Japan could pull the US in to a, a pretty major conflict. If the US does nothing, that's, that doesn't look good to our allies. If the US get, gets pulled into a war, that's probably not good either. So that's one paradox. Um, why don't you talk about the other ways in which the, the paradox exists? Thank you. It's really nice to be here and to see you all. And uh, thanks, Mary Kay. And congratulations on all you've been doing with your reporting. It's, it's nice. I mean, you know Asia so well. And so it's a real treat to be up here with you. I think that the simplest way I can define the paradox is to say that the logical application of our treaty commitments could lead us to a war far more dangerous and destructive than the stakes could possibly justify. And so that's the simplest way to describe the paradox. The Senkaku Islands are sort of my poster child for the book and the title, but I'm also worried about things that China could do elsewhere in the Western Pacific, the Scarborough Shoal with the Philippines, buzzing an American air, uh, aircraft carrier and accidentally running into it with a plane and killing 50 people, uh, Russia taking a small town in eastern Estonia or Latvia under the pretext that it's defending native Russian speakers in one of those countries. And its real goal is not to take the Baltic states, but to just put NATO on the horns of a dilemma, sort of a crisis over what does it mean now to defend the territory of one of our allies that's you know, in theory, justified in asking for help because of the Article 5 mutual defense provisions of the NATO or US-Japan Treaty. So the broad problem here, I guess it's always existed as long as alliances have existed. But usually alliances were built, and in the Cold War they were built, because we were worried about some country trying to completely annex or conquer another. And in today's world, I'm less worried about that. I'm more worried about China or Russia probing, trying to reassert their ancient greatness, the way you alluded to, uh, trying to right some historical wrongs and grievances in their own mind, trying to change the world order and the power distribution, especially US alliances. And so I think these kind of probing attacks might be especially appealing, because they don't have to do something that automatically engenders a huge American military retaliation. And if we do decide to retaliate militarily, they can maybe pull back, or at least they might be tempted to think they could pull back in time before a big crisis ensues. In other words, it might be tempting enough that they just try it. And last year, before he resigned, Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, under the Trump administration, wrote a national defense strategy that, as many of you will know, said that Russia and China are now the top priorities for US military planning. First time since the Cold War that we had sort of a nuclear-armed great power as our main military concern. And that's a pretty scary thought if you take it seriously. But it still begs the question, how could a war against China or Russia really start? Are they really going to, you know, is China really going to try to grab Tokyo? I don't think so. Is Russia going to try to grab Poland? I don't think so. Maybe Russia would be tempted to try to grab an entire Baltic state. But I think they're more interested in pushing, probing, weakening, challenging, and sowing doubt in the West. And China's more interested, as you alluded to, in sort of getting back at Japan and then just being first among equals in the broader Western Pacific and ideally winning without fighting, but creating enough of a coercive effect 
that countries buckle uh, rather than face them head on. So f because of these concerns and where I think we are in history with both Russia and China, I'm worried about these small probing attacks over stakes that are themselves uh, seemingly insignificant. But as you point out, if we actually did nothing at all in response uh, to one of these scenarios, that would be <laughs> pretty scary because allies would have to wonder, does the U.S. commitment mean anything at all? And China and Russia would have to wonder, hey, if we got away with that, can we get away with even more. So that's why I thought the problem was important enough to write a book about and lay out an alternative strategy, which I'm sure we'll get to later. Which we'll definitely get to. Um, but related to China's strategy, I mean, it actually does have the strategy of kind of probing and doing just enough that um, it's able to advance its interest, but not so much that it provokes a response. There's a book you, you're probably familiar with that also came out this year, China's Gray Zone Military Operations by Andrew Erickson. He's with the Naval, U.S. Naval War College. And you know, he goes into great detail and lists many examples of ways that China has pushed forward just a little bit in the South China Sea, in building the artificial islands, but it's, it's usually not a, you know, a huge step forward all at once. It's making a few claims and then coming back later, not necessarily even in a predictable fashion and making more claims. Um, and you know, basically, placing the bet each time that you know, the US doesn't really want to go to war over this. The US has treaty allies. The US you know, has been this Asia Pacific power. But by just sort of whittling away a little bit each time, like, OK, so you're not really going to fight us over this, right? Yeah. But then the allies look and say, you're not, you're not standing up for us. You're letting China get away with getting away with doing this, with building these artificial islands, and then, you know, attacking Vietnamese fishing boats and Philippine fishing boats, and you know they're using Chinese fishing boats, but they're backed up by the Chi Chinese Coast Guard. So, um, when you're talking about the Senkaku paradox, you're talking not about something that might happen, but something that already is happening on an ongoing basis. That's a fair point, uh, but what hasn't happened yet as you know, is one day the Chinese just finding their way ashore with 100 troops. And to me, that would be crossing over a Rubicon that would lead, lead us into a whole different domain. And on that scenario, I was also motivated to write the book when in 2014, my old friend, uh, John Whistler, who at that time was the head of the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force in Okinawa, and he had been a Brookings Fellow, and he was Lieutenant Colonel Whistler, so I knew him well 20 years earlier. But he was asked by a journalist in an on-the-record uh, meeting about three years after China had cut off the rare earth mineral shipments to Japan over the Senkaku dispute that had happened back around 2010. Uh, Whistler was asked, what would the United States and Japan do if we woke up one day and we saw Chinese forces ashore in one of these eight islets, you know, the largest of which is a couple of uh, square kilometers? and the smallest of which, as you said, are basically just rocks. And none of them would qualify, I don't think, for economic zones under the Law of the Sea Treaty because they can't really sustain a human community. Anyway, Whistler was asked what we would do. And he said, well, if we were so instructed, we could take them back. And then he continued, and I can actually think of options we would have where we could deal with the problem without having to put anybody ashore. And so first he's alluding to an amphibious assault, effectively, and then he's alluding to a bombing campaign. And I was very happy that General Whistler said those things because I don't want this sort of slippery slope, salami slicing problem for the Chinese to think they can just keep, you know, like the frog in the boiling water, just sort of keep getting us used to the new normal and next thing you know, the Senkakus are theirs. So it was good that General Whistler said that as the top Marine in the Pacific, but I think it would be probably not our best option if it actually happened to do what he said we might. It's good to have that in our toolkit. It's good to have that possibility. But you know, if the Chinese wind up with 50 people on a Senkaku Island, they're going to make up some, some excuse for why they're there. They're not just going to say, we are here to conquer lands that historically in the 14th century were once Chinese. They're going to probably be more clever, take a page out of Putin's uh, cookbook and, or playbook. So I think we have to worry about that kind of a crossing of a new threshold. As long as we continue to protect our rights for freedom of navigation in the South China Sea, I don't know that we have to solve every island and reclaim sandbar problem. I think we should push back diplomatically and perhaps economically. But the real worries that I have are when there's a, a, a new military level of activity that makes some people think we have to prevent it or 
or reverse it by force. Those are the scenarios that I'm most worried about. So let's get to the toolkit. Um, so you make the point in your book that you know once a, a, a power, whether it's China or Russia or wh whomever, um, has occupied territory, it's kind of hard to get them necessarily to leave. It's much harder than preventing them from doing it in the first place. So what are some of the options for uh, making a power that might be aggressive in ways that are against US interests think twice about making a play for something like the Senkaku Islands or Latvia or wherever? Well, I think that we need them to understand the many options we have and that many of them are credible. Because, you know, just today, Bloomberg News reported that President Trump is apparently having conversations with his staff about whether we should consider abandoning the US-Japan Mutual Security Treaty, right? That was in the news today. I hope this is just one of President Trump's occasional musings that he lay, later decides not to follow through on. And for the most part, he's backed away from those kind of comments, which he made a lot of when he was a candidate. But in an era where someone like President Trump is our commander in chief, and I don't think it's just about Trump, I think it's a more general challenge, is it really credible that we would in fact evict the Chinese by force? So the real answer to your question is, that, is to show that we have options that are credible and that would be credible even if someone like Donald Trump, who doesn't really care as much about all these alliances and global commitments, uh, were in the White House. So let me just take a Senkaku example. There are eight of these islands. Let's say the Chinese take one or two. Instead of evicting them or bombing them, what I would propose is that we, together with Japan, put US and Japanese forces on the other six. So we set up our own little encampments. We swing a larger fraction of the Seventh Fleet towards that part of the general region. We probably embark on a military buildup. We probably raise the defense budget even above the 750 billion that Donald Trump wants for 2020. And it's already pretty high, but again, I'm comparing all these options to the risk of World War III with a more kinetic approach. And that's what I want to avoid. So I'm prepared to spend a little money on the defense budget to avoid shooting at Chinese forces and then not knowing what comes next. And then the essence of the strategy is economic punishment. And, and, and this is another area, of course, where the Trump presidency is interesting because he's got a lot of tools he's using against China, primarily over economic differences of opinion and slights that he thinks China has been perpetrating against us. And he's probably largely correct about uh, at least the need for some different approach on the American side. Whether you like his approach or not is a different matter. But the, the basic notion of punishing China enough that whatever benefit they think they get from these islands in economic terms or even in broader terms is just not worth it. I believe that is a credible approach. But we need to do some preparation because we need to make sure we're not vulnerable to their retaliation. And as the world increasingly depends on China being involved in almost all supply chains for electronics especially, we've got to make sure that we don't you know, I want to use various agencies like Treasury and the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, USTR, to make sure we don't exceed certain uh, maximum ceilings of dependence on China for key critical national goods. And we should be building up our national defense stockpile. We should be ensuring that we have diversification in global supply chains for key electronics. Um, we should be uh, taking other steps that anticipate where China could hurt us and our allies. Rare earth metals are another example where we need greater stocks than we've had before. Because I want China to know that not only are we willing and able to punish them, but we can survive whatever punishment they direct our way in reply. And I think we can still prevail in that kind of an economic uh, war with China, even though our dependence on China is much greater, of course, than it used to be. And they can hurt us too. But again, I'm not necessarily concerned about this being pain free. I just don't want it to risk World War III. And you argue that uh, this, whatever economic sanctions, what e whatever economic steps are taken, that this should be done in coordination and close coordination with the military strategy. That right now things are too siloed. Yeah, so if you think about how we react in the United States to a national security crisis, it's, it's sort of um, perplexing and, and unfortunate because the only places in the US government where we plan any kind of war are in the military. Because when we say military, or when we say war, we think military. But if it's a Senkaku Island or one town in Estonia, I want to think first and foremost about economic warfare and prevent 
firing the first shot at a nuclear armed superpower. So I want the essence of the strategy to be economic and the military part to be in support of that. And there are other scenarios where I could imagine interdicting oil from the Persian Gulf headed towards China, but this is still designed to have the military operation be in support of an economic strategy and not be right next to China's coast where China has the geographic advantage. So I want Treasury and uh, the National Academy of Sciences and places that think about our mineral and economic dependencies and the U.S. trade rep. Uh, I want uh, these organizations to be in some kind of planning cell where they are not second fiddle. They're not just sort of being seconded to a DOD-driven operation, but they are actually as central as anything. Right now, because we are only doing this kind of planning through the military, you know, it's the old adage, if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I don't blame the military for that, because other agencies in our government are not set up to wage economic war. And if we try to do it, we do it through the National Security Council once a crisis has already begun. But the NSC is not a planning organization. It has 300 people. They're managing day-to-day, -day, you know, inbox issues. They're not doing longer-term strategic planning. So I want to get the whole of government involved in the planning now so that we figure out where our uh, vulnerabilities might be. This is all in the interest of deterrence. This is all in the interest of making these scenarios not happen. I'm not looking forward to a big economic war with China or Russia, but I think that as long as they know we figured out in advance the ways that we can hurt them economically more than they can hurt us and avoid having to fire the first shot in anger in one of these scenarios, then our deterrence becomes much more robust. So speaking of scenarios, um, there are many very, very specific scenarios that you set out in, in the book. Um, and I recommend them to you if you're interested in thinking about different ways that the US and China, the US and Russia could in, possibly engage in conflict right down to the tonnage of the warships at, at sea and who has the advantage there. But something that really surprised me was how often nuclear weapons came up as an option. I mean, it's been 74 years since nuclear weapons have been used in war. Do you think things are changing where there uh, people making the decisions are actually starting to actively consider them again? Yes, but I think it's more likely with Russia because Russia's told us that the answer to your question is yes. Now, they might be bluffing. They say a lot of schmack, you know, and uh, I don't take everything equally literally, but they're, what they're trying to do is make us think that they care more than we do, that they might just be crazy enough to launch a nuclear weapon at an aircraft carrier or at least at a... Uh, you know, military equipment supply ship. For those in the audience who are fans of the Battle of the Atlantic in World War II, you know, we had, we lost thousands of ships in the course of resupplying or preparing D-Day and resupplying Europe because all the ships were small and we could afford to lose a lot. It was a tragedy how many people we lost mm -hmm. along the way. But today, if we're gonna move our military across the ocean, we basically got about 30 really huge ships that we do it with and if those ships were destroyed and all the equipment on them were destroyed, or much of it, we'd be sort of out of luck until we rebuilt a new armada. But, but the theater. Chinese have a non-nuclear missile that could take out an well, aircraft carrier. Well, you're right, and I should come back to China. But I, I, with Russia, what I think that uh, Putin might consider is identifying a military asset where he could say, yes, I'm going to use a nuclear weapon. I'm not going to use it against a city. But once we've crossed the threshold, everyone's going to get scared that this thing could go to nuclear attack against cities. Mm -hmm. And the West will back down first because they care less and they're less resolute. And I'm Putin and I can think these sort of issues through. I'm better at it than they are and I've got the stomach for it and they don't. I think, and Putin's basically said as much. Russia has a strategy they call escalate to de-escalate. Go to the nuclear use in a limited sort of quasi-surgical way if you want to dust off your Dr. Strange love, uh, but try to go after a military asset that is isolated from civilian population centers, destroy it, show you're sort of half crazy, and then try to you know, propose some kind of terms for peace where you get three-fourths of what you want. And, and assume that there won't be a retaliation. Well, you know, Putin might be willing to play that game and take those risks more than we. If he decides that, yes, there's a tiny chance it gets out of control, but he's pretty confident he's just a lot better at this kind of brinkmanship than we are. By the way, he's probably right, but uh, he's probably also not crazy enough to really want to do it. 
And maybe he's actually figured out the Senkaku paradox strategy before I did, because I think maybe, he, maybe what he knows is that if he ever starts messing around in this way, any hope for economic engagement with Europe is done for many years to come. And what Europe's done so far by way of applying sanctions will be child's play compared to what Europe could do, which is basically cutting off oil and gas uh, imports from Russia and developing alternative supply. Europe could do that if it was prepared to pay a higher premium. And I think we should actually encourage Europe and subsidize the building, for example, of more liquefied natural gas terminals so they have more options. But I think Putin's he's, he's figured that out, so that, that's why he won't do this. It's not so much that he's really afraid of nuclear war, because he thinks the fear of nuclear war is going to actually affect us before it affects him, and therefore he'll win without having to risk that. That's, at least that's a part of Putin's brain. Now, it, Putin may not ultimately decide it's worth the risk, but what about the guy after him who's just as pissed off at the world, just as petulant, just as much interested in advancing Russian glory, and not as cunning or careful as Putin, who at the end of the day usually does pick his battles pretty carefully. So that's my assessment on Russia. You know, it's not a high likelihood they're going to do this tomorrow, but I can certainly imagine how they can get themselves to take a risk that they think they can control the dynamics better than we, and that they think they can stomach the danger better than we. So let's say the, your, that some of the European countries are, or the EU overall were to say, okay, we're not going to take Russian oil anymore. I mean, that's kind of the death of the Russian economy. Do you think that in that circumstance, the Russian government would like pull a North Korea and say, okay, we're going to play brinksmanship here until you um, allow us to have some kind of a path forward economically? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know how Russia responds. I'm not suggesting this economic warfare strategy is risk-free because there are moves Russia could take next that would be dangerous. But I would rather play out the dangers in a strategy that's fundamentally not about firing weapons and that goes more slowly, that where the economic moves and counter moves play out over weeks and months. What I'm really scared about is nuclear armed countries trying to resolve a crisis in hours and days. And of course, we haven't even mentioned the word cyber yet, but one more thing that you could try to do if you were a Russia is to so disrupt our command and control, perhaps through a cyber attack, that we're now sort of half in the dark or half you know, blinded about what's going on. So we're, we're not only suffering dangers and risks, but we're also unable to communicate the way we wish. We see much of our civilian infrastructure getting affected this way, and yet he hasn't actually fired a shot at us either. So. Um, uh, I, I, there are a lot of dangers in these scenarios, but if they stay in the realm of economics, we have more time to try to work them out. We don't have to hope that, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis took 13 days, right? I mean, the next time we have something like that, it could take 13 hours, and that's where people make mistakes. I don't want the fate of our safety to depend on decisions made in hours. Yeah. Um so I, I believe there were some uh, suspicions in NATO that when in the most recent uh, NATO, well, the NATO games in, in October, the NATO war games, that uh, Russia did interfere with the GPS mm. signal. This was a, a, a scenario where it was if Norway w were invaded by Russia, that NATO would come and, and protect Norway. And there was, there was certainly interference to the GPS signal. That's just a small thing, but it, right. it at least sent a signal of we can do this if we want to. Right. Right. Um, so speaking of cyber and new technology and how that changes the nature of war, um, you know, a lot of what you wrote about in the book was about sort of conventional war, conventional tactics, mm -hmm. but you also talked about like drone swarms and submarine drone, um, uh, you know, attack submarines and um, unmanned ships. And I'm kind of wondering how that affects the way that you game out how to respond to the Senkaku paradox. Mm. Um, like if, if everyone's using, because both sides can use drones, right? Both sides can use unmanned ships. And so you just have like stuff fighting each other or, mm. I mean, does that change how willing people are to go to war? Does it just keep, you know, just keep destroying each other's equipment until someone takes it to a civilian population to make it hurt? So I didn't try to be super clairvoyant on you know, looking so far into the future that we could imagine Terminator-like robots and things like that. I'm, I'm one step before that. So I'm thinking about swarms, drones that operate as a network, um, either through artificial intelligence or more just advanced algorithms that, where they just sort of are checking in with each other and repairing their 
matrix of capability to try to impede our ability to come to a certain predictable location. This is just, um, in a way, it's already gotten very hard for a country like the United States to approach the shores of a sophisticated, high-tech country. Uh, it was, you know, it was hard in, on D-Day, mm -hmm. but it's gotten much harder in the era of precision strike and the era of 24-hour reconnaissance. And even if we try to jam somebody else's satellites or shoot them down, um, and even if we try to maneuver in a place where they're not quite expecting us, if we have to come into the lion's den because we're trying to liberate Estonia or liberate the Senkaku Islands, it's just too predictable. And there are too many things they can already do if they know where we're coming. And then by 2040, I think the problem is just going to get worse because of the kinds of robotics. Robotics are, you know, still limited by real world constraints on their propulsion, on their uh, endurance. But if, 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 if you can deploy them in a very limited area because you know where the enemy has to come because you're sort of luring, him, luring the enemy into your own home bastion, then I think you've got an advantage that's just going to reinforce the dilemma. So I don't want, this book project sort of began partly as the way we discussed, you know, John Whistler and, and uh, these concerns about what Russia or China might do to try to weaken our alliances, change the world. But I also began by looking at technology and where I thought it was headed. And I thought it was just going to make the problem of attacking a superpower near that superpower's territory already a daunting proposition even harder. So that's the main way in which things like robotics come into my argument. So, so what do you think the US military should be doing now that it's not um, to prepare for that kind of conflict? Again, with the, with the first point being, I think the other parts of government need to be asked to prepare and change even more. Mm -hmm. DOD, in a sense, I think only needs to make relatively modest changes because what I'm proposing is that we build on strengths we already have in places like the Persian Gulf. So if, if we're going to have a, um, you know, a warfare scenario against China that's economics-based, I would like to disrupt the Chinese access to raw materials that comes from a place closer to where we have bases and allies further from their territory. And we're already ahead in that game. The Chinese are gradually catching up, but they got a long ways to go. You and I were talking about the String of Pearls and Djibouti, and maybe we'll come back to that in detail. But you know, these are just first forays into being a global superpower of a type that we already are. So what I'd like to be able to do is sustain that advantage. Uh, and there are a couple of things I would recommend. One is uh, long-range strike platforms. We've got to make sure we have enough of those, things like stealth bombers and uh, attack submarines. But also, I would like to have more non-lethal weapons. It's striking to me, from a military technology point of view, how bad we've done at developing non-lethal weapons. Because even in the 1990s, back in the days of Somalia and Black Hawk Down, and so we, we were talking about how we needed ways to incapacitate a crowd without having to shoot everybody, because most of the people in that crowd were not enemy. They were just you know, civilians who were masked in some way in protest or you know, where insurgents were taking refuge within a population that they knew we wouldn't attack. And so we didn't have a way to deal with that problem in Somalia. What I want to be able to do is stop a Chinese-bound oil supertanker without having to do what Iran just did and put an explosive on the side of the ship. I'd rather be able to incapacitate the motor. Now, we could try to aim at it today with uh, an explosive charge that would hit near the propeller and leave the rest of the boat alone. But that's a little too cute, and we really might, you know, cause the kind of damage that I'd rather not. Again, I'm hoping for a scenario in which even if we do start shooting weapons, we can delay the first casualty. And so um, non-lethal weapons are a big part of my R&D, research and development agenda, that goes along with the strategy in the book. In including cyber, right? Like if you cut yeah. their system, they can't, you know, they don't know where they're going. They. It's true. although. The thing about cyber is, first of all, we're vulnerable to retaliation, but at least it's in this same kind of realm of non-kinetic. But we may be more vulnerable still than certainly Russia. But also with cyber, you don't really know what effects you'll have in advance, hmm. and you also don't know how long they'll last until the other side can patch them up. So cyber is the great wild west of military attacks. We're never quite sure you know, how well it's going to work. 
And sometimes it works better than you thought. Probably the North Koreans did better with the Sony attack than they even expected. Uh, we wound up doing better in a sense with the Stuxnet attack, but it wound up, you know, spreading and be, being detected in a way it wasn't supposed to be. So it became even more potent than we wanted. So cyber has this funny way of, of being unpredictable. Yeah. And, and that's why I think that it's a, it's a good tool to have in your toolkit, but I also want ones where I can pick more narrowly, we can pick more narrowly exactly where we apply and what effect we get from the non-lethal weapon, for example. And, and you do stress several times in the book that um, reacting to these actions that are below the level where like going to all out war is appropriate, um, reaction should be calibrated and should be proportional. Proportionate to the what to what had happened. So I mean it, yeah. this fits in with what you're saying about, you know, just to be um, not overreacting. Like not yeah. Even Donald Trump's with me on that one, right? He didn't want to kill 150 Iranians because he said it would be disproportionate. He even used that word. And so um, I, don't mind, I don't mind hurting the Chinese two or three or five times more than, than they benefit. Just to, to make, but I want that pain to be definable in economic terms primarily. And so what I don't want to have to do is cross over from a threshold where they've got people on an island, the ownership of which we don't even have an official US government opinion about, as you said in the intro. And then we, in response to that action, we now have to use lethal military force against the world's number one rising superpower, you know, well, the number two superpower, but the number one rising superpower with nuclear weapons in its arsenal. I, I really don't wanna be in a position where we have to cross that threshold or it appears that we are irresolute. That's a pretty bad place to be. So, um, and by the way, if the, if the Chinese take one Senkaku Island, with due, all due respect to any uh, Japanese in the room or people who um, have Japanese friends, and I have a lot of Japanese friends myself, but they, they hate it when I say this, I don't really care that much how fast we get that Senkaku Island back. It's not the issue for me. It may be the issue for Japan. It's not the issue for me. To me, the issue is making sure China doesn't think that it can continue down this path. They have to know they've just made a big mistake, they're gonna pay a price for it, and we're gonna take a number of steps in the region to make it much harder for them to do anything similar. And those are the two things they need to get uh, and need to understand. Punishment, and then a more robust forward defense from that point forward. If it takes them tw 20, 30 years to leave the, that one Senkaku Island, or if in the end Japan even acknowledges that they can have one, or there's some kind of a shared sovereignty, that's okay to me. To me, the, the key issue is that having successfully taken a Senkaku Island, Ch China doesn't wake up and then take the other seven and then start to look at Okinawa. Uh, uh, decide that the claims that it's already made that uh, part of North Korea, which was the founding kingdom, Koguryo of, of Korea, was always part of China. That kind Chinese of thing. think tanks have been saying this since 2005, much to the dismay of both North and South Koreans. Um, you mentioned the string of pearls, um, which brings us to China's Belt and Road Initiative, or the New Silk Road Initiative. So China's in the middle of building out infrastructure, ports, roads, railways in about 70 countries right now. And it's basically this grand plan meant to shift the center of gravity of global trade to China. Um, that adds all kinds of wild cards, cards into this equation, because rather than just um, needing to look at the Senkakus or at the South China Sea. Um, China now has a port in Sri Lanka in Hambantota for the next 99 years because Sri Lanka couldn't pay its, uh, its bills um, to repay the debt. Uh, China's building out <coughs> the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. It, it has interest in, in Gwadar and that port. Mm -hmm. I mean, what happens if something happens in one of those places and the Chinese government says, okay, this, this is worth fighting over? And the U.S. is like, well, wait. You know, I mean, like, there, there are just many more pieces to the, uh, to the puzzle, to the relationship. Um, and I'm wondering how you feel the Belt and Road Initiative, what China's trying to do with it, and how China's pulling allies or partners in um, through that network is going to change the equation, if at all. Great question. Well, the first thing I would say is that I don't want to fight to defend Sri Lanka or Pakistan or... Um, you know, Myanmar or any of the other countries where they're getting a bum deal from China potentially, and may, China may even decide to use force to somehow enforce uh, one of its contractual rights under these 
deals which are often very unfavorable and done opaquely. I don't want to use the military for that. <laughs> and you know, it's hard enough to figure out how to defend these places where we are sworn to defend them. I mean, again, I probably should have emphasized early on, the book focuses primarily on countries, our NATO allies, Japan, where we have formal Senate ratified treaty commitments that have Article 5 mutual defense promises, which means an attack on the territory of one of these countries we treat as the equivalent to an attack on the United States itself. And we're sort of already in the position of having stated that and having that be the, you know, so that's a whole different place to be from China doing something unpleasant to Sri Lanka. Because we're going to feel a lot greater pressure to honor those commitments. And a lot of Americans are going to say, um, you know, you can't let aggressors get away with this kind of thing when you've sworn in advance to defend certain territory and then you fail to do so. It's going to bring too many memories of Munich and Hitler. And even though people, some people won't be overly impressed by any, you know, analogy to Hitler, uh, the Cold War had examples of where the Soviets were trying to make inroads in Berlin or Cuba or what have you. And so there are plenty of examples in history. And, and so I'm most worried about places where we would feel this really powerful pressure to respond because of Article 5 or something like it, the mutual defense pledge in a Senate ratified treaty that's at the cornerstone of the post-World War II international order and US alliance system. So the cases you mentioned are important, but to me they're already in a different category, and I'm less nervous that we would be likely to go down a military path to deal with them. Having said that, if we get better at thinking through the toolkit of economic warfare strategies, then we might have some tools that would be applicable. And I'll give Donald Trump credit for one thing. He's already helping educate people about some of these economic warfare instruments because he says to the Treasury Department or CFIUS or US Trade Representative's Office, give me some more options vis-a-vis -vis China. Usually I don't like his strategy, and I, I certainly don't like his strategy when he starts wanting to punish our allies and our friends like Canada and Mexico. But we are starting to get a little smarter about sanctions. Also give credit to President Bush and President Clinton and President Obama because the sanctions we applied on Iran and North Korea and Russia have been more selective, more smart, more effective than many of the sanctions I think we applied during the Cold War. And whether you like the Iran nuclear deal or not, it was the sanctions that got us to a place where it was even possible. And whether you think that President Trump's going to pull a rabbit out of a hat on North Korea or not, it's the sanctions that have made the North Koreans interested in talking, as Kim Jong-un said in Hanoi earlier this year. So maybe some of the, maybe learning more about how we can think of sanctions as an instrument of foreign policy in response even to military aggression could help us with a Sri Lanka scenario. But for the most part, I'm not trying to solve all the world's problems with this one book. I'm mostly trying to solve the, the problem that scares me the most, which is that we wind up in a war with a nuclear armed country because we don't see any other way to honor a pledge to an ally that we're formally committed to defend over one of these, by itself, insignificant issues where the adversary has figured out that this is sort of our Achilles heel, that by going for this insignificant issue, they can throw our whole alliance system into uh, you know, a, a, a very difficult place. So um, yes, it, it could be relevant to Belt and Road, but I see the tools for dealing with Chinese misbehavior in that realm as being somewhat distinct. Do you think that there's a possibility, or are you at all concerned that given the current trade war that we're having with China that we've been having for a year, that maybe we're not keeping enough powder dry in case we do want to use economic sanctions in, if, if there's Chinese aggression in the South China Sea or yes, toward yeah. the Senkakus? Yeah, I think most of, you know, I should have been more clear earlier about wh where I'm appreciative or at least um, open-minded towards some of President Trump's tactics. I think he's recognized we have a severe economic problem with China that President Obama was starting to recognize. And Trump has just taken the response to a much more intense level. But the actual approach, I don't think, is optimal. Because my colleague David Dollar just wrote a great blog on this today about the effects of what these tariffs have had. Yes, they've caused China a little bit of pain. They haven't really solved any of our trade problems. 
and, and Dollar goes through all the statistics. For a former World Bank representative in China. Right, and so our imports from China are down a little, but imports from other countries are up because supply chains have already uh, repositioned to some extent, and overall, uh, other countries are importing more from China as a response in some ways, and it really isn't working on its own terms very well, except causing both China and the United States a little bit of pain. So um, yes, I'd rather keep powder dry on sanctions for things where it really matters. I think with China, the economic strategy that makes more sense is the one that focuses through um, CFIUS on the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, severely limiting what China can do to invest in high-tech sectors here. So I think Trump's use of CFIUS uh, against, let's say, Huawei is, is smart. On the, I think for the most part, I agree with that. The 25% tariffs, I think, are mostly not smart for that problem and should be held in reserve for the kind of issue I'm talking about. One more Belt and Road question, and that is related to the string of pearls, to the ports that where China has a stake uh, and a presence going all the way through Asia and then the Middle East and into Europe and down to the Horn of Africa. And of course, China's first uh, foreign military base is in Djibouti, its naval base. Um, that's, I mean, and China's been working toward having a blue water navy. Yep. It's been, you know, there've been double digit increases in military spending for at least 20 years. Um, does that complicate things in terms of what the U.S. needs to do? It's not just about whether you get close to China's uh, borders when you're thinking about how to respond. It's also about dealing with China as another naval power in the Pacific. Yeah, it's a great question. It's still pretty early days for China becoming a global naval power. And it's, it's enough, you know, there's enough happening that it should be concerning and we can see where it's headed. But for the time horizon of the next one to two decades, in those parts of the world, China's still gonna be a gradually arriving power. And you point out all the progress they've made in their military budget and so forth, and it's true. But just for those who aren't tracking this stuff in detail, there's sort of a yin and yang to it. I mean, China is unambiguously the world's number two military spender now, as you're well aware, um, up in the range, you know, their official budget is only in the low 100 billions, but it, their actual budget is probably in the low 200 billions. So it's probably one third of ours, roughly speaking, and way ahead of anybody else. Saudi Arabia is number three at about 85 billion when you convert on the market today. Most of our major allies are sort of in the 40 billion to 60 billion range, and that's sort of where Russia is too. So just to situate, you know, you're thinking about dollars and cents and budgets. Having said all of that, the reason why China's budget has gone up so much is because China's economy has grown so much. And we still think they're spending less than 2% of their GDP, of their gross domestic product, on their military. So if they were a NATO ally, they could potentially come under withering scorn from President Trump for not spending enough and, and not doing it. Now, they're not a NATO ally, obviously. But I'm just trying to point out, when people talk about China's military budget increasing, what they've essentially done is hold steady the fraction of their national wealth that the armed forces receive. That's enough to be pretty concerning. It's one step short of a major arms race, in my opinion, maybe even two steps short. So um, I, I'll give China a little bit of due. You know, by the standards of rising powers in history, they are not behaving particularly recklessly or aggressively. However, they are a rising superpower and they are flexing their muscle. And who knows what they'll do in five or 10 more years as they get more capability and more confidence. And so, yeah, my strategy may not work forever. But I think this strategy, I think it still can work for a couple of decades, which hopefully is a period of time during which we can maybe start to resolve some of the real issues that risk war between the United States and China. So that by the time China's fully, um, not fully, but largely caught up to us in these realms, uh, it might not matter as much. Well, and of course, the other key issue you, you focus on in the book um, that could draw the U.S. in is how China deals with Taiwan. Um, in the next five to 10 years, uh, you know, I mean, one thing that could happen is that uh, as China's economy slows and if the population becomes, I mean, this is something that China watchers have been saying for, for 20 years, um, 
you know, at what point does the Chinese government decide it's worth just going for it? It's worth, you know, trying to pull Taiwan in and say, you know, we've always said Taiwan is part of China, now it has to be part of China. Um, I mean, what do you, how do you read that possibility? And you've talked about ways the U.S. could respond if China does make a, a, an aggressive move toward Taiwan. Yes, so this is the hardest scenario in my, in my book. I do have a Taiwan scenario in the book. It's of a fundamentally different type of problem because, of course, 23 million people are at risk. They're not a treaty ally, so that puts our credibility slightly less on the line. But as many of you will remember, um, they used to be a treaty ally, and we used to send, or at least we used to treat them as such, and we used to have formal relations with them, and we used to, under Eisenhower and others, you know, make nuclear threats or send aircraft carriers right in China's face. And even in the Clinton administration, we sent as aircraft carriers. As recently as 1996, yeah. right before Li Donghui was elected. Yeah. So um, I don't think the Chinese are likely to try to do an amphibious assault against Taiwan because I still think that's uh, mil militarily very difficult. And also, once you start that, if you're losing, you can't gracefully back off. But you can do all sorts of blockades and maybe even combine them with attacks on command and control through cyber, through special forces, maybe even through targeted assassinations of Taiwanese leaders. And if you combine that with a blockade, you could put Taiwan in a bad place. And that's where I feel like I most need the options in the book to go threaten China's economic lifeline in the Persian Gulf. That's where I really feel like the scenario of trying to shut down their access to a lot of oil becomes relevant because in that scenario, time is not on our side the way it might be in a Senkaku scenario. Again, Japanese friends don't like to hear me say or any of us to say that um, you know, we could live with the Chinese occupying a Senkaku island for some number of years, but we could. Mm -hmm. And so could they. The Japanese wouldn't like it, but there are no Japanese who live on these islands. Whereas if Taiwan's economy is being strangled by even an imperfect blockade, then I think we need some tools that are more robust. And the old-fashioned way of handling this problem was to break the blockade through American naval dominance. But I don't think that's going to be nearly as realistic going forward uh, because, again, it's so close to China that they're carrier killing uh, DF-21s and 26s and other things Andrew Erickson has written about other systems that don't even require nuclear weapons to be effective could lead to some major American loss of life if we try to open up a shipping lane into Taiwan in the face of a Chinese blockade. So that's where I want to move the scenario and the operation as much as possible to a part of the world where we enjoy military superiority. And you don't think they'll just get oil then from Russia or from Central Asia? I, I think they would, but um, you know, I guess what I would acknowledge is I don't have 100% confidence that my Taiwan scenario works, but I also am pretty sure that the current Taiwan scenario in the US military may not work either. Hmm. We're getting to a point where defending Taiwan without risking escalation is getting potentially too hard. I'm not suggesting we cut our commitments to Taiwan categorically, and the Chinese should worry that if they attack Taiwan, maybe we actually think about taking a piece of China. You know, I don't want them to totally have that idea out of their head. Uh, but that's not what I wrote the book about. What I wrote the book about was options that are easier and less dangerous for us to threaten, rather than ones that are more dangerous. But I first started looking at naval blockades of Taiwan as a military analyst 25 years ago. At that point, I was quite confident the United States Navy could break the blockade. Hmm. I am no longer so confident. And I certainly don't think we can be confident and sure that we would break the blockade absent losing several ships and maybe even dozens of ships. So we could lose many thousands of Americans, depending on which ship was sunk, in this kind of an operation, even if the Chinese don't use nuclear weapons, even if they don't escalate. So um, I think we're going to have to get a little bit more creative about how we think about a military defense of Taiwan. And putting pressure somewhere else, not necessarily going straight for where the Chinese are defending Taiwan or defending what they've already done. Right. And in the first instance, I want to go after their economic lifeline, not their people and not their territory and not even their military. So again, I'm trying to have escalation pathways that are credible because they can cause a lot of pain with, without having us take what Thomas Schelling called you know, the, the last clear chance to avoid war, w without us having to sort of... <laughs> 
uh, be the party that that takes that option off the table. That um, Schelling, the great nuclear strategist, always talked about you know uh, who would have the last clear ch chance to back down. And um, what I don't want to do is put us in a place where we're the only country that can sort of avoid the nuclear risk. And the way we have to do it is to give up on our commitment to Taiwan. I'd rather have a third approach that's neither capitulation nor escalation. So last question. Um, so start, be, start thinking about what your questions will be. Um, you cast forward in the book as far as 2040. And a lot can happen in 20 years. Um, but as you're thinking about wild cards, so not China and Russia, but other nuclear powers, uh, North Korea, Pakistan, possibly Iran, and how the US, how, how these same techniques might be used if uh, something comes up where, as has, always, as has already happened to a certain degree in North Korea and Iran, you know, there's, there's some sort of provocation perhaps doesn't rise to the level of, you know, we need to go to war with this, with this country right now. Do you think this would also work in those cases? Well, with Pakistan, we're not a treaty ally any longer. And so, and Pakistan tends to be the mischief maker vis-a-vis -vis India in terms, you know, if there are Pakistanis in the audience, my apologies, but in military terms, I think that's a, a statement of fact. You could say that in historical terms, it's the Indian, uh, grab of Kashmir that produced the reason why Pakistan does this. We can have that debate some other time. The, the main point is Pakistan is not an ally, and usually if there's a, a, an act of violence in South Asia these days, Pakistan started it. So I'm not that worried about coming to Pakistan's defense at the moment. <laughs> it's not central in my concern. Maybe you were talking more about how Pakistan attacks India. In that situation, India's got the bigger military and nuclear weapons. And I think our main job is to essentially back up India diplomatically and otherwise, not uh, depending on how the crisis began. But with North, with North Korea, we've already, of course, fortified the um, intra-Korean border. It's the most fortified border on Earth. And so much of the natural response to a provocation of a limited type, we've, we've essentially already put in place. Plus, we've already seen a lot of these kinds of provocations, like the sinking of the Chonan uh, Navy vessel that the North Koreans carried out in 2010. And the South Koreans wanted to retaliate then. We held them back. Frankly, if the North Koreans had done that to us, I think we would have retaliated. <laughs> so we, we, tried to act, we tried to talk to the South Koreans as if we were being the mature, calm party and that they needed to calm down. But in fact, I think the United States, we would retaliate in that kind of a situation. The South Koreans chose not to. But the South Koreans also made it pretty clear that next time they will retaliate. So uh, no, I actually don't think that my strategy needs to be applied to those cases. I think there's already enough uh, specific history, sort of case history, as a lawyer might say, and uh, enough precedent about what would happen in those places that this is fundamentally a problem for dealing with a nuclear armed superpower that has enough capability to make it very hard for us to come close to their shore and has enough interest in changing the basic structure of US alliances and the global order of today that they might decide to play this kind of a high risk game. So that's the real, I'm not trying to solve Belt and Road. I'm not trying to solve Pakistan and North Korea. It's fundamentally about China and Russia. And, and do you think that the bigger risk over the next 20 years is a rising superpower or a fading superpower? I think it's too close to call. So I, a lot of my friends, a lot of people I know say China's the greater problem, especially long term. I'm not in that camp. I, I don't know how to say who's a bigger problem. I think Russia, with 135 million people, 11 time zones, 5,000 nuclear weapons, and a lot of pissed off political leadership beyond Putin himself to many others, and a suppressed democracy that can't necessarily check their own, um, you know, often corrupt and often authoritarian political class, that's a very dangerous country. And it will stay very dangerous for the rest of my life. So um, no, I actually think in my gut, I actually, maybe as we go to the audience, I also would pose this question to you because I'd like to hear your opinion on this. In my gut, I think China would like to see the international order change, and they'd like to take Japan down a peg, <laughs> but they don't have quite the same animus against us that Russia does. Mm. 
So China has more pure capability, 10 times bigger population, faster growing economy, et cetera. But I think China wants to put some Chinese characteristics and imprints on the global order, but largely continue to benefit from the goose that laid their golden egg. Whereas Russia, I see as a fundamentally, you know, we, we use terms like revanchist, but I think pissed off is a more accurate term. They're just angry with us for expanding NATO, for uh, having all these wars in the Middle East where they think we bumbled around, for encouraging democracy movements in the former Soviet republics and even in Russia, uh, for waging war in Kosovo. Uh, you know, they just, Putin in particular has a list of grievances that's very long. And his process of becoming angry at us dates back to the 1990s, and there just kept being more and more and more accumulated grievances. So I think Putin would love to destroy NATO even more than China would love to destroy the US-Japan alliance. So in the end, I actually, even though the Senkaku paradox is the title of the book, I worry slightly more about Russia at the moment. And over time going forward, um, I worry sort of about them roughly equally. But I, I would love to hear your opinion as we also maybe invite others in the audience to weigh in here in a second. Let me first say, Michael O'Hanlon, thank you so much for this great conversation. My pleasure.